the word community down there. Joyce and Richard have been doing this for almost 30 years. Defines, defines community. I was interested, poor Richard has had to figure out how to introduce me without repeating himself for many of those years. So I will, I'll read a poem that I think I read at the first watershed gathering about watershed. Spring rain. Now the rain is falling freshly in the intervals between sunlight. The Pacific squall started no one knows where drawn east as the drifts of warm air make a channel. It moves its own way like water or the mind and spills this rain passing over. The Sierra will catch it in la as last snow flurries before summer observed only by the wakened marmots at 10,000 feet. And we will come across it again as Larkspur and Penstemon sprouting along a creek above Sonora Pass next August, where the snow melt will have melted into Dead Man's Creek and the creek spilled into the Stanislaus and the Stanislaus into the San Joaquin and the San Joaquin into the slow salt marshes of the bay. That's not the end of it. The gray jays of the mountain eat larkspur seeds, which can't propagate otherwise. To simulate the process, you have to gather, soak gathered seeds all night in the acids of coffee and then score them gently with a very sharp knife before you plant them in the garden. You might use what was left of the coffee we drank in Lisa's kitchen visiting. There were orange poppies on the table in a clear glass vase stained near the bottom to the color of sunrise. The unstated theme was the blessedness of gathering and the blessing of dispersal. It made you glad for beauty like that, casual and intense, lasting as long as the poppies last. It made you glad for water. So I'm just gonna read a few poems from this past summer, they, they begin in, in the natural world, they sometimes go into the one we've had to live in. <laughs> Clouds, luminous and high, billowing over the stony massive of Sierra Peak, and some ice yet in the wind shivering the leaves of the aspens, it's late June, high spring, the little fluting trill of a dark-eyed junco, out on a limb and upside down, a mountain chickadee going about its chickadee business, which seems to require a steady diet of insects going about their insect business in the aspen, and a sudden shaft of sunlight, foretaste of summer, flickering glimpse of the American sublime, and what the ant or the spider or the chickadee or the junco, which evidently wants a mate, knows about the cosmic drama of being on this planet under light and clouds we are never going to know. I know a painter, Latin American, who went to Paris in the 1950s to try to paint like a cubist or an abstract expressionist and felt he was getting nowhere and went to Italy and looked for days and weeks at painting after painting and came out of the galleries and the museums and looked he said, at the clouds, and understood, he said, the relation between light and volume, and was ravished. An hour later, the chickadee is gone, the sky is suddenly broody and still and mute gray, and then it's June, scintillant, alive, it has begun to snow. So, that's one. So, the sky tonight, on the top of the ridge, is bruise-colored, a yellow-brown that is one definition of the word sordid, which I think, used to describe a color, carries neither a moral nor an aesthetic judgment. The sky at dusk was sordid, and then brightened and softened to a glowing peach of brief but astonishing beauty if you happen to be noticing. 
poems veer. This one could take a hard right here to the angry adolescent boy in Texas who shot and killed 19 children with a high-powered rifle my culture put into his hands. The connection is tenuous, a bruise-colored sky and 19 dead children, their bodies pierced by shells manufactured for the purpose. How to enter the hive of that boy's mind and undo what the imagination had done there. He bought body armor at a local store, two rifles, one of which fires 40 rounds a second, one of which fires 40 rounds a second. He had it specifically in mind to kill children of that age, the life-bodied young in their end-of-term clothing. The connective tissue in this veering is the idea that it is the experience of beauty, not rules, not fear of consequences or reverence for authority that informs our moral sense. This may be where John Ashbery would introduce a non sequitur, <laughs> not from aversion to responsibility, but from a sense that he no doubt had that there was a kind of self-importance in the introduction of morality to poetry in the places where we are helpless to do anything and that one might therefore be better off practicing one's art in more or less the spirit of the poor juggler in the story of Christmas who, having no gift to bring to the infant God, crept into the church at night and faced the crash and just juggled. Play, beauty, the impulse to reproduce it, the impulse to evoke and bring to rage and then to stillness the violence in our natures. The next veering, undertaken without cynicism but in the spirit of frankness, leaving aside Plato's originary arguments about beauty, would be to introduce the collection of records they found in Adolf Hitler's bunker. There were more than a hundred rows on rows of young men hurled by their officers at one another's cannons and machine guns. He rose one morning, walked down to his studio by the Pont de Giverny and began to paint the water lilies and kept painting them as long as his hand could hold a brush. It's late. I need to return to the subject of that boy's mind and the art we practice. And the sunset, peach to dull gold, which faded to what felt for just a second, for less than a second, a blessed and arriving silence, and then a pale green at the skyline, and then dark it was Monday night. Plato's idea, I think, was that beauty was an ordering of the elements it offered, and that the harmonies in that order taught the soul what was good. Later culture would say the boy was taken by a demon, and they studied ways to exercise it. That devil had a name. It was love of evil. And us? Is there a practice of the art that would install, inform, would deeply root a culture that would form a mind or heart in which these young bodies in the classroom floor had become unimaginable because of a love of the good that would be a love of the good as ordinary as the children's end-of-term tennis shoes? Probably not. Do we need to be able to touch that mind at that age? It could have come from being laughed at once. Or perhaps there was a sexual thrill in putting on the costume, carrying the rifle, saying, I am doomed as he strode across the parking lot. Is there a way to undo the stew of computer games and horror films and superhero fantasies that gave language to the moral injury he wanted to inflict? Or the culture of resentment and fear that put the weapons in his hands? These people run governments. Here's another veering turn. Think of how Walt Whitman loved this country, loved the president who died imagined himself as a hand brushing a fly from the brow of a sleeping child. In the darkness, 
I thought of Walt Whitman and a radiant ordinariness that burned, that burned and burned. Wow. So, dark stuff, necessarily. Um, one more poem. Okay. This is called uh, Not Rhyming Moon and June. It's 20 to 12, Frank O'Hara, and almost 50 years since you proposed this way to start a poem, late at night and off the cuff, and I'm needing a little of your swank. These are difficult days. For example, the Supreme Court's majority looks like a bunch of high school principals from hell. It's not just that they are straight jacket Catholics perfectly willing to impose their moral views on every scared, pregnant adolescent in America. That is leaving aside the morally unambiguous experiences they are imagining or failing to imagine of women rape, girls and women victims of incest and abuse who are expected to carry babies to term as surrogate mothers to the high moral ground they want to impose on them. You should hear them talk about what wonderful medical care and system of orphanages they're going to set up while they also, in their reverence for life, put assault weapons in the hands of boys and make sure they can carry them in public so the next Valentine's Day massacre can occur on an uptown train. It would make you sick. And I know there's no point in ranting if you don't have the sting of Swift or the tart sanity of Auden. Here, Frank, is my somewhat lame attempt to conjure Auden's spirit. I want to lean on Auden for a tune. It's late at night and late in June, and though I haven't a tenth of the facility with which he marries music to sobriety, we could use a long sip of his clarity. He's the one who would have seen right through the unspeakable Clarence Thomas and the prim, reasoning Samuel Al Al Alito, who is, as it turns out, as mean as a snake. And what's her name, who wants vouchers for private school so white girls can be taught chastity in a comfortable setting. And the frat boy Kavanaugh, and John Roberts' dithering version of prudent compromise. Remember the Czech novelist who remarked that all rats think they're Hamlet? It would take an Auden to say in rhyme with a dry asperity that they have to be morally dead to do what they're doing and that they're morally dead because they're on the make and are pretending that what they are doing is a strict historically informed reading of the famous 18th century document. Margaret Atwood might be able to get at how nauseating their self-righteousness is and their contempt for the women demonstrating outside the marble columns of their court, and more, that it took a particular education to deform them into instruments they've become. She could describe that with her characteristic acid exactness. Poets, as Czesław Milos has written, shouldn't have to be professional mourners. You loved it in the 1950s that Gary Snyder was in the mountains out west botanizing in the Sierra Meadow, listening for the twang of a pygmy nuthatch and counting the petals of the flower of a pale sulfur yellow sink foil. And he liked the idea that you, the war over, the aftermath of Hiroshima and Auschwitz sinking into the neural synapses of the world's collective brain, were on a lunch break, trying to choose between Pernod and Galliano to bring to the dinner after the reception in the gallery. I would recommend Lillet, and since it's June, it should be chilled. We have to, after all, get on with life. Well, we do. You don't, Frank though we still need your huge and generous heart. We have a lot of work. There are monsters to be dislodged. Uh, Joyce and Richard, my God, thank you so much. Thank you for this. One remember Mark Baldrich, Arthur Akamura.
water, paths, trees, flowers, birds, the living world, and these guys tending it for us for all three decades. Thank you, you so much.